Hello everyone and thank you for joining us today. My name is Brandon Burton with Restoration Sciences Academy and today we're going to run through a presentation on monitoring efficiently and effectively. Uh, this is our third webinar in a series of 10 and in this webinar uh, we're going to build on some of the conversations that we had in the previous two webinars where we really discussed how to best balance humidity, airflow, and temperature and turn our direction towards understanding how to monitor especially the moisture that is present in building materials to understand the effectiveness of our humidity, airflow, and temperature. Uh, in this presentation we're predominantly going to focus on the decision-making process that we look at related to understanding what is and is not working in the drying environment so we understand when changes are necessary in the environment based on what we're seeing in the monitoring process. A couple of quick notes before we get started. Uh, if you have any questions at any particular point in time uh, in terms of access into the webinar uh, and audio, etc., if you're having any issues, uh, please use the information you see on screen right now and contact Anne at our office in the UK. Uh, you can see the number there on screen. Uh, also, if you have any questions at any point in the program, there should be a menu bar somewhere near the top of your screen and if you take a look at the icon one in from the left hand side a little chat bubble there uh, if you click on that that'll open up a chat window and in that window if you post a comment either to me or to all uh, then I'll be able to see those comments as we go through the presentation today and make sure that I can address them so uh, then with that we'll go ahead and get started again thank you for joining us today for this presentation uh, I'm excited to run you through this topic it's one of my uh, more passionate topics in the world of restorative drying. So with that, what is monitoring and what is monitoring about? Why is it important? What is its purpose? What is its role in the restorative drying process? And uh, to kind of kick things off, I'd like to start with a little analogy and a little simple quote. Uh, basically, efficiency without any proper purpose can be just as disastrous as it can be beneficial. Uh, and I love this cartoon uh, by a gentleman named Larson where we have this convict trying to escape out of a jailhouse is being highly efficient in you know digging a tunnel here to get out from underneath the jailhouse that he's been trapped in the problem is uh, as he doesn't really have a good game plan in mind he doesn't know where he's headed and uh, it's going to be disastrous in about 30 more seconds as he's digging this tunnel uh, it's kind of a silly analogy but at the same time it, it really drives home what we're here to talk about today and Regardless of what we do in a drying environment in terms of creating you know, very aggressive conditions, and it appears that we may have lost some audio. If uh, those of you that are joining me on the webinar, oh, hold on one second. Uh, the screen sharing is possible. I'm going to back up here real quickly and uh, unlock the screen sharing. Just one moment. There we go. Uh, so anybody who is logged in on the webinar side, you should now be seeing the screen visuals. I apologize for that. Uh, but coming back into our conversation, you know, the cartoon here that I was using to illustrate where we are and, and where we came from in the drying process to monitoring, uh, you know, here we see somebody like I had mentioned just a moment ago who's trying to, you know, efficiently, you know, dig his way out of this jail cell. And uh, what I mentioned just a moment ago is obviously he's in a path for, you know, pretty immediate disaster because he doesn't have a really good game plan in mind uh, for exactly where he's headed. Um, and that's, you know, as, as we were beginning to discuss, that's what monitoring really is in the drying process. Monitoring is the opportunity for us to understand exactly where we're headed because no, no matter how aggressively we set, you know, a good drying environment, uh, if we don't understand what that environment is doing, uh, what those conditions are doing to building materials, to moisture, and where that's taking us, uh, then we can just as easily create very substantial damage in the drying environment as we can good progress with building materials. You know, it's really an interesting kind of double-edged sword because, you know, what we're doing in a drying process is we're going into an environment and we are creating, you know, very extreme differences in in energy and conditions and in humidities and 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 conditions uh, related thereto, and those those differences can just as easily cause moisture and challenges uh, to create secondary damage as they can drying if we're not careful. Um, you know, especially when we don't see the project at, in some cases on a regular basis. Uh, so it's very important that we understand where exactly we're headed, uh, which is the analogy we're portraying with this. So with that in mind, uh, you know, to kind of lead us through this conversation, I want to take you through you know, a relatively simple flowchart 
that kind of embodies what inspection really is, what monitoring really is, and relate that to how that influences decisions in the drying process itself. Generally, one of the first things that we're trying to ask in inspection and monitoring is just trying to understand what's wet within the drying environment and what's become affected. Uh, obviously, this is the foundation that builds for us the scope uh, upon which we determine all of the other work that, that needs to be provided on the project. Um, you know, I often get the question from, from many restorers and, and experts in our industry, you know, if certain items can or cannot be dried in a restoration environment. And my response is always that you can dry anything. So that's really the wrong question. The right question is, should you? Uh, and should you leads you down an entirely different course, a different path. But the only way I can answer the question if we should or should not dry something or if we should replace it is if we first have the right data to base that decision on. Uh, and that begins with asking this very simple question, the first question in inspection and monitoring. And that's just knowing what's wet. Uh, and it sounds like a really simple question, but in reality it can be quite complicated uh, and it's very often not completely or fully addressed. Uh, knowing what's wet or understanding what's wet requires that the restorer, the technician, know more than just something about water. They have to know something about the building materials and the assemblies. Uh, you know, the kind of the common vernacular in the contractor world, the builder world, is you have to understand the components, not just the assembly. Uh, for example, I, I can't just understand that I'm looking at a wall assembly. I need to understand exactly what comprises that wall assembly. How many layers are there? What are the layers made of? Because how can I know what is wet if I don't know what's there? Uh, you know, quite simply. And too often assumptions are made about what an assembly is made of. And when we make that assu assumption, then we don't know what kind of permeance issues are going to be present. Uh, we don't know how deeply absorbed the water may be. We don't even know what instrument to use, what meter to use, because we don't know how deeply the water may have penetrated. But once we understand what is wet, if we understand that properly, then we can make very appropriate and responsible decisions about restoration, uh, which are really based on three criteria. Once I know an item is affected, it's wet, you know, there are three things I'm going to ask to determine if I should or should not restore that item. And the first is contamination. You know, if we're dealing with, you know, obviously sewage backflowing into a building, you know, things like, you know, soft textiles are obviously generally not going to be restored. Uh, we then look at damage for anything that's still standing after the first question. We look at damage and has the water caused a permanent change in the condition of the material, the integrity, the appearance, etc. And if it has, again, generally, then it's not going to be feasible to dry or, or restore the material. Generally, it's going to be replacement. And then finally, we look at cost. Obviously, it needs to cost less to dry a material than it does to just straight out replace it. Um, but I, again, I can't answer these questions to determine the best course of action in restoration unless I first know what is wet in the environment actually, right down to the component level. Uh, now, these two components, understanding first what is affected within the environment properly, and then properly considering, considering rather the best drying approach or restoration approach is the foundation to our monitoring process. And the better this is done initially, the better this is set up, the better the foundation moving ahead uh, for me to properly monitor the environment uh, so we understand what course and direction we're going to take. Uh, just as a quick note, some paraphrasing for what you see on screen right now, uh, you, know, you have two options opportunities once you finish the assessment of what is wet and then evaluated the you know feasibility of restoration uh, and those two opportunities or options are on the left hand side you remove materials use inter-air drying or change the permeance of materials something we're going to spend some time on on a later webinar and on the right hand side you know we instead dry the material using humidity airflow and temperature something we discussed in the first two webinars uh, which by the way if you missed the first couple of webinars you know check out the uh, the website uh, the dry ease UK website and uh, you'll notice there that we've got a link into the RSA webinars and you can catch up on those once we understand what is wet and and what is affected and we deploy a drying approach the next step in monitoring is then to determine exactly how wet the building materials are that have been affected. Uh, understanding how wet something is is critical to the monitoring process uh, because we cannot determine the direction the drying process is taking us if we don't know where we started from. You know, the analogy that I commonly like to use is, 
Uh, if if uh, you know we're all trying to run a race and I'm the only one that knows where the finish line is, then obviously we know who's going to win because I'm the only one that understands where we're going to finish. You're going to all have to follow me to get there. And understanding how wet things are is kind of the same same principle. If I don't know where we're coming from and where we started from, then I have no idea in subsequent monitoring visits if we're making any progress or not. You know, the most common mistake made here when trying to answer this very important question is that many contractors do not do it on the first day. You know, they walk into an environment, they see that the uh, you know the flooring materials are obviously saturated. They're walking across the flooring materials, and water is literally ringing up around their feet. Um, and in that process, they say to themselves, "Well, we don't need a moisture meter because obviously this is wet. My eyes tell me it's wet." The problem with that uh, very short-sightedness is that the moisture that's ringing up around your feet out of the flooring materials, that water is going to be extracted. It's going to be vacuumed out of the space. That's not the moisture or the, or, the, or the water that we're going to be drying in the restoration process. The water we're going to be drying is absorbed into structural materials. And the only way to understand how much of that water exists is to break out an inspection kit and perform some monitoring and determine with a number, a quantified value, how much water is actually absorbed into those building materials. And without that number, you know, the next time we come back to the project, uh, any number we get from that building material is actually quite irrelevant because we don't have a benchmark to compare it to. We don't have a number to make reference to. Uh, at that point in the project, you know, it could be three, four, five days later in some cases that we're coming back to the job. You know, we could now easily have five days of drying in place. Uh, best case scenario, one day of drying, but in some cases longer. And now we have a number for the first time coming back, you know, on the second monitoring visit. And that number could be 30, it could be 50, it could be 100. It wouldn't matter what that number is. If I don't know where we started from, then we may have not made any progress at all. And we don't have any idea that we haven't. Uh, and to be quite honest with you, it's quite criminal because we have several days of drying effort, um, several days of drying resources that have been deployed, um, and absolutely no point of reference to determine that if it's, if it's worked or not. Um, now, we'll come back to that thought in a moment. Uh, just to keep you up to date here on the decisions that would be made at that point in time. Uh, so coming back to the flow chart here, first remember we understood what was wet and then we decided should we replace it or should we restore it. Uh, then we came down here to understanding well exactly how wet are the items that we will restore. Then we deploy the appropriate amount of drying equipment to match that environment. And just paraphrasing here, because again, this is another subject for a later webinar, uh, this is how we would size our drying equipment to the restoration project. It's a very simple table uh, where we have some definitions on the amount of moisture in the structure based on absorption and material type, and we'll walk through that in a later webinar. Uh, and then we have a reference down here to the number of liters of, of water removal per day uh, that we need for every cubic meter within the drying space that we're trying to dry uh, for a number of different types of dehumidifiers. Uh, and then for desiccants, the number of air changes per hour we need based on the same information. Um, so just kind of a teaser for you, this is something we'll cover on a future webinar, and I'll give you some background and some basis for this when we get to that point. So now that we understand how wet we are, then we're done with the initial monitoring visit. And it's an important note to make that both of these questions and all of these related decisions, so what's wet, how wet, and all of the corresponding decisions that we make are all occurring on that initial visit uh, to the project. Then we come back in a follow-up visit. Uh, and it is highly important that at least that first follow-up visit be done promptly. Um, I, my recommendation is to do it within 24 to 48 hours for that first visit. Um, there are some reasons why we can have more time between monitoring visits later in the project, but initially that's when the project has the most water on site. Uh, that's when there's the highest risk for something to go wrong. Um, that's the first time that you're taxing the electrical system of that building and you don't know if it's going to fail. Uh, it's the first time you're testing the occupants to find out if they're going to move equipment around on you and turn stuff off so they can go to sleep at night. You know, all of these things you're experiencing for the first time on that project and you don't know which one of them is going to throw a monkey wrench into the process. So it's pretty critical that you come back very promptly, at least in that first monitoring visit, and ask the most important question in monitoring. And that is, is it drying? 
know, is it making progress? Are we moving in the right direction? Uh, and there are two potential answers to that question, obviously. One is yes, and that's the answer that we're looking for. And if it is, we'll move down the process, and I'll show you that in a moment. But the answer could very likely be no, uh, that we're not making progress. And if the answer is no, you know, follow the, the response here and see where it takes us. Uh, basically, if what we're doing isn't working, then we have to change what we're doing. It's very simple and straightforward. I don't know if any of you are familiar with the definition of the word insanity, you know, but insanity is when someone does the same exact thing over and over again, and every time they miraculously expect something different to magically occur. You know, that's insanity. A clinical definition, and we could commit you to an institution for doing it. So restoration is no different. You know, you spend several days with a particular drying system deployed, you come back, you know, one to three, four days later, you find out that there is no progress and you don't change anything. Right? Clinical definition of insanity. So it's important that we recognize that and not be insane and make a change. So what change do we make? Here again, using the decision making that follows monitoring, we use the same exact mentality. The first question we're going to ask with this material that hasn't made any progress is, is contamination now an issue? And if you waited five days to come back and monitor and it didn't make progress, I'll guarantee you it is. Uh, if you waited a day to come back and monitor and there was no progress, there probably isn't a contamination issue. And that's that difference in the time of response for that first follow-up visit. You have an opportunity to correct problems before they become an issue. The longer you wait to come back to catch those problems, the greater the risk they're going to become a substantial issue. If contamination isn't a problem, then we take a look at damage. You know, possibly, if it's been sitting for one or multiple days, there may be some damage if it hasn't made any progress. Swelling, staining, color transfer, loss of structural integrity, uh, degradation of those forms, etc. Uh, if there is damage, then again, we probably know what direction we're going to adjust. Uh, we're probably not going to install more air movers for an assembly that's fallen apart. We're going to remove it, right? And then finally, last but not least, if there is no contamination, there is no damage, then again, we evaluate cost. What will be more cost effective for that assembly? Replacing it, putting some holes in it to inject air inside the assembly, changing the permeance by getting rid of some surface layers, or applying a better humidity, better airflow, and or better temperature in the drying process. You know, which of these is going to be the most cost effective? And, you know, and frankly, in my opinion, it doesn't really matter to me which of these changes you make. Uh, because any one of them are going to increase the chances of success. Uh, if you remove some layers, it's going to dry better. If you put some holes in it, it's going to dry better. If you change its permeance by perforating it or removing some vinyl or something like that from the surface, it's going to dry better. If you put a lower humidity along the surface, it's going to dry better. You know, if you put the airflow closer to the wet surface, it's going to dry better. If you warm the material up, it's going to dry better. So all of these are going to work. What you've got to ask yourself as the responsible restorer is which one of these is going to be the most cost effective. And that's the art in the restoration process. Uh, so make one of the changes. You know, an analogy I'll give you towards this is, is to be quite frank, you know, I don't really care when I ask the question if the news is good or bad. I, when I ask, uh, is it drying on that project, on that next visit, if it's bad news, that's fine. If it's good news, that's great. In either case, it, that's not what's important to me. What's important to me is that the news is timely, it's accurate, it's repeatable, it's valid. In other words, I want the straight story coming in 24 to 48 hours later so I know exactly where I stand so I can make accurate corrections or assumptions that we are indeed moving in the right direction in either case you know good information in leads to good decisions out it's project management 101 um, and I think all of us can probably reflect on the fact that if I get bad information when I ask this question obviously we're going to make bad decisions and if you want a great example of bad information in bad decisions out you know study politics for a while I'll give you a good example so is it drying? Is it making progress? Uh, you now, a couple of mistakes that are commonly made on this step that are very important to avoid. The only way that we understand if we are indeed making progress or not is if the following occurs. Number one, we have to use the same meter type and setting on the follow-up visit that we used on the initial visit. So when we ask the question, how wet is it? and we come back to ask is it drying it has to be the same meter type and setting at a very minimum I'd prefer the same exact meter uh, because meters slide out of calibration a bit but if I go in on this date 
with meter brand X and then I come in on this date with meter brand Y then we're going to get different results simply because we're using differently calibrated instruments and we're not going to be able to compare the data furthermore not only does it have to be the same meter type and setting it's got to be placed on the same material at the same location if you move your meter across the floor to a different spot or across the wall to a different spot again you're going to get a different number so you have to ensure that the instrument is being installed at precisely the same location and then finally last but not least you also need to ensure that the technician who monitored on the first day to determine how wet it was and the technician who follows on the next day to determine if it's drying that they document the information in exactly the same way in other words uh, you know I have a, I see a tendency by some technicians to grab a non-invasive GE survey master moisture meter and some of you may be <clears throat> familiar with that particular meter it measures on a scale of zero to a thousand uh, so you get a reading anywhere from zero all the way up to one thousand or somewhere in between but they have a setting on that meter that also measures from zero to one hundred and there's a tendency of some technicians to use the non-invasive meter and when they get a reading of you know, 999 and they're used to seeing on a scale of 0 to 100 they call it 99.9 .9. they put a decimal in there when it doesn't belong and that's okay if everybody in the business is doing that exact same thing but if one technician's thrown in a decimal and the other isn't then technician A is going to go out and they're going to write down 99.9 .9 then the next technician is going to come out and even though there's progress they're going to see 800 on their meter which is obviously far higher than 99.9 .9, and they're going to think somebody turned the water back on so the documentation system also needs to be consistent so meter use meter location and meter documentation all three of those need to be set into a fixed process in the business and done in exactly the same way on each monitoring visit so very important stuff without that I don't know if we're making progress or not and again I would argue that determining whether or not you're making progress is by far the most important question that we're asking in the restoration environment because I'm not hired by my customer to determine what's wet they already know the buildings wet uh, I need to know what specifically is wet so I can set my scope and I'm not hired to determine how wet things are I need to know that to do my work but a property owner an insurance company could care less if it's 30 or 35 points on a moisture meter that's data that I need what they want to understand is how am what I do what I'm doing on this project taking us from that wet condition back to a normal condition faster than nature would do it by itself you know what what evidence do I have that my role my cost to the process is expediting that rate because that's what's pre preventing damages and that's what's mitigating cost uh, that's what's reducing the spend so it's very important that I can justify to this and speak to it confidently and doc document to it confidently but this is the heart of the monitoring process is asking and answering this question so with that in mind and, and kind of zooming back out you know here's a full look at the process and what I want to close this process out with is to say that you know in this process there is a component to this that is inspection and there's a component to this that is monitoring and it's important that we understand the difference so we can do both of them efficiently inspection is what you see highlighted in blue an inspection is when we go in and we look for a high level of detail let me give you a case in point an example when I go in the first day to a room with my instrumentation and I'm looking at one particular wall I may place my instrument you know at a hundred to you know, hundred and fifty locations on that wall just kind of moving it down the wall trying to understand where the water is and where it's absorbed that's inspection it's a tremendous amount of detail and I'm looking for a you know a very precise determination for the amount of penetration and migration that we've seen now when I come back and, and do my monitoring visits I'm not going to put my meter in all 150 of those locations I don't have time uh, it's not practical it's not feasible so while I'm doing my inspection on that wall where I placed my meter in 100 plus locations I'm gonna pick three maybe four spots 
that I'm going to mark with a piece of you know releasable painters tape or something like that something that'll stay temporarily in place for me and I'm gonna name that spot and when I come back in my monitoring visits I'm going to ensure that what we're monitoring is that one or four or five depending on the material that one spot and I'm gonna do it in exactly the same way every day now that's the monitoring that is in between so inspection lots of detail find out where the water is find out how wet it is find the worst information find the wettest numbers name those wettest locations and use those as your subsequent monitoring locations then come back and monitor those those same spots and track the progress and if there isn't any progress make change the drying system don't be insane etc but when we come into the final stage of drying notice how we're shaded blue again down here the final stage transfers back into inspection you know using that same example on that wall we were checking five specific locations there's a chance that those five spots will dry differently than the rest of that wall so when we're ready to start pulling equipment off the job we have to go back into an inspection mindset and instead of checking five spots in the same way now we need to put the meter back in a hundred places on the wall and just verify that the rest of the assembly is reflective of our monitoring points that it looks the same it's exhibiting the same type of measurements uh, and you may find in some cases that there'll be some spots and some anomalies that, that don't look the same uh, and it's critical that we catch those before we pull off the job wipe our hands clean of it and call it done uh, because any excess moisture that we leave behind obviously is going to be conducive you know to some uh, significant damages in the process now moving away from the the overall monitoring process there are a number of of instruments probes attachments etc that we can use for inspection and uh, I'm going to spend some time on these as we go through in, in a later series in the webinar I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it today uh, this is a, a good solid hours discussion by itself uh, what I want to do today however is just kind of give a high level overview that inspection and monitoring must include at a minimum the three devices you see listed on screen I must have an invasive instrument an invasive instrument meaning an instrument with probes and attachments that allow me to take destructive pin type penetrating meter readings into an assembly um, and then I must also have a non-invasive a non-invasive uh, this instrument that we see on the lower left is actually both it is an invasive type using pins but you'll notice on the bottom of the instrument this is a survey master by GE that it's also a non-invasive it's got a, an RF emitter on the back that allows it to measure moisture in materials without actually using a physical pin um, there is way too much credence placed on this type of non-invasive measurement and inspection and monitoring there are lots of reasons why this reading is going to be highly erroneous uh, and we have to verify it with invasive instrumentation and we'll spend some time on that when I get later into our webinar series and we dig deeper into the instruments themselves um, so understanding that balance will will be an important discussion and then finally we have to have hygrometers you know devices that allow us to understand that humidity airflow and temperature component that we spent time on in the first two uh, parts of this webinar series so those are all required uh, there are other devices that are nice to have an in inspection and monitoring to be to be quite frank none of them replace this suite of instruments those instruments then need to be documented into some form of a documentation tool and I want to kind of show you the good better best here for documentation you know, good documentation now here's a handwritten variant of some documentation uh, has a moisture map a moisture map is going to allow us to draw out the area within which we're doing our inspection and monitoring uh, it's going to indicate areas of migration uh, affected versus unaffected etc uh, and then within that moisture map we're gonna have named monitoring locations and then those named monitoring locations are going to be drawn out into a record of actual moisture content uh, and here in this record of moisture content we can see that we have data from the first day of the project we have data from the second day of the project and we can make comparisons between these to determine what direction the material is headed um, a couple of things about this particular form by the way that I want to draw out uh, because they're important and that is that first of all you'll notice up here towards the top of the screen I'll circle that for you that we have our instruments our settings and our location or material type noted this is very critical in your documentation we have to understand 
what meter device is being used and where it's being used in the project so that we ensure when we come back on subsequent visits this is replicated in those following visits. In addition to that, also notice that I've got multiple days worth of readings all on the same piece of paper. In other words, I've got day one right here and day two right here on the same piece of paper. I'm not filling out a form on day one with this information and then filling out an in separate, a completely separate form on day two with this information. The reason I don't want to do that is because the purpose of this document is to make comparisons. I don't care how wet you were on day one. You need to know that, but I don't frankly care. What I care is how different are you than day one when we come in on the next day. Uh, that's what's important, and the only way to, to, to really make a time-efficient analogy to that is, or a comparison rather, is to have that information on the same piece of paper. Now notice another thing that we're doing here to try to speed up the process. On this side, I've got a column here that says average, and we note that on day one, we had a material type here that averaged 25, and when we came back for a follow-up visit, that same material averaged out to, to 16. Uh, extremely valuable for me to take this look at this one point of reference and know that we drop nine points on our drying scale uh, over this period of monitoring. In this particular case it was a 24-hour period. Um, so this is one example of what a monitoring form can look like. Um, it's a good example, it's not the best example. And there are a couple of reasons why it isn't the best example. Uh, one of the reasons why it isn't the best example, if you'll notice I'm pulling over an average moisture level here and this is a handwritten and hand math mathematically solved form 18, 24, 26, 25, and 20 do not average out to 16 and this form is therefore very open to human error um, and uh, I always like to try to push as much of the documentation over into something that's going to number one speed up the process, number two improve appearance, and number three eliminate human error. Um, and uh, that's my short formula for loving Microsoft Excel so much by the way for anybody who's familiar with it. Um, so anyway, good form, not the best form. Um, taking a look at a, you know, a better rendition of documentation you know, here we're taking a look at a, you know, a document that has been produced in Microsoft Excel. And all this is, if you're not familiar with Excel, I'll bet somebody in your business is. Uh, whoever handles your accounting in your business is going to be intimately familiar with Microsoft Excel because it's probably what they're using for a lot of their analyses. Uh, but all this is, is a template built in Excel where a couple of cells have been built you know, to capture the actual readings that are being taken on the project. And then you know, a graph has been built in to graph that information out so we can track it in a visual sense, in a visual format. And things like averaging out the measurements on a daily basis is being done for us automatically. Now see the value on this and how efficient this becomes in my communication. 25 became 19, became 15, became 11. Now how quickly can we tell we're making progress? Well the only way that it would be faster is to look at it over here in a graph. Not only can I see the speed at which we're making progress, but I can see the change in the rate of progress as we make changes on the job. For example, we made great progress initially, began to slow down, we made a change on the job, look what happened to my rate of progress. So it's, it's very easy to, to take a look at it from that perspective. Um, you know, taking a look at it, again, same, you know, same type of format here, but just taking a look at a larger scale uh, set of numbers and readings. You know, imagine, if you will, that you're a technician and you've got to look at all of this information and ask yourself, is it working? I'll give you a few minutes because that's a lot of numbers to take a look at, right? It's going to take you a while to figure out if you're making progress. Now, if I add in the ability to track some averages on the project, it becomes faster, right? I'll give you a couple of seconds because that's all it's going to take. Now, if I provide you with the graphical information here, I don't need to give you any time at all. In fact, what's better about this rendition of the documentation is notice the red line is your average moisture level. The blue line is the drying goal. Now if I supply this graph to a loss assessor, an insurance adjuster, a property owner, a property management company, um, you know, a general that I'm working under, and I say, you know, down is good and blue is done. Do you have any questions? then I'm not going to have to wait very long for them to say, okay, it's good, right? In other words, the communication is instantaneous. And, you know, I'm being a bit facetious with it on purpose. And the reason that I am is because it's critical that we understand 
that documentation and monitoring is not only to allow you, the restorer, to make good, sound decisions about drying the building and be effective. Because quite frankly, it doesn't matter how good of a job you do. If you can't take credit for it and communicate it and show it and illustrate it, then that good job, to be quite quite honest with you, is, is, is on deaf ears. And it's not going to lead to growth in your business and building your rapport and reputation. You've got to be able to take credit for the work that you're doing and communicate it in a very clear and concise format. And your documentation and your monitoring are done to serve that purpose. Um, so it's, it's important that we have this ability to document in this way. Um, so moving forward on the examples here. Uh, this is an example of recording temperature and relative humidity or drying conditions if you will on a regular basis and I want you to note the same thing about this particular form that we took out on a look at on the last form and that is that I've got multiple visits dates and times all being put on the same piece of paper that is critical again to monitoring especially in the world of psychrometry and temperature and relative humidity it's confusing enough to talk about temperature relative humidity grains per pound etc it's confusing enough as it is now separate all that information on a different a bunch of different pieces of paper it becomes even more confusing when in reality what we're trying to do is quite simple I want to understand is the humidity in the room that I'm drying on a downward trend on a regular basis is the humidity de decreasing regularly if it is great I'm in control and then I want to understand for anybody who is on the webinar with me at the beginning of two series I want to make sure the humidity is the same throughout my different drying chambers so I've got a living room area I've got a bedroom area I want to make sure that those conditions are equal across you know those environments so again here I'm making a comparison it's all about making comparisons just as it was with the moisture levels in the different materials that we we're monitoring all I'm trying to do is just make sure that one number and the next number line up well and that they make sense and I can't do that if I don't have all of the information on the same piece of paper on the same screen for me to take a look at you know for example if if all I told you is you know, come down here that we had a 33 percent relative humidity and 35 grains per pound and I didn't tell you anything else about it you know or grams per kilogram in a metric scale if I didn't say anything about another reading in this environment then there's no point of reference for me to understand what that number means you know it's, it's like telling somebody how fast you're driving in a vehicle you know and saying you're doing a hundred kilometers an hour and is that speed good or is that speed bad well it depends you know if you're in the parking lot for the local shopping center probably a bad idea right if you're if you're on a, a you know a thoroughfare or a freeway uh, then it probably is okay but without that point of reference the speed doesn't tell me anything so same thing here with the psychrometry without the point of reference you know the numbers themselves don't really tell me anything so uh, that's our first uh, you know session here on monitoring efficiently and effectively uh, hopefully we've given you a good number of, of tools and strong thoughts and considerations about the monitoring process what's important in that monitoring process and the questions that we're trying to ask and answer And a quick recap you know there are four areas that I'm trying to understand in inspection and monitoring it's initially just knowing what is wet in the environment so I can set my scope for the project appropriately that means I have to look at building materials not just on the assembly level but on the component level I have to know what's actually there then I've got to decide what I'm going to restore and what I'm going to replace uh, again a conversation for a later webinar once we make that decision then on the first day we need to understand exactly how wet those materials are uh, that's the only way on the first day if I do that it's the only way that I can come back and determine if we're making any progress when we come back for subsequent monitoring visits I then need to use the same meter on the same setting at the same location of the same material and document it the same way that's a lot of the same thing right consistency in exactly how the instruments being used so I can determine if we're making progress doesn't matter if the news is good or bad what's important is that the news is accurate and that it's timely and that first visit really needs to be done sooner rather than later to determine if what you're doing is working if it's working great but if it's not remember that definition of the word insanity right we have to move back to square one and change what we're doing 
If it is making progress, great. We'll continue the process and determine if it's done. So with that, I appreciate the time that you spent with us today, and I encourage you to take a look at the dryease.uk website uh, and take a look at the RSA link off of that website. If you come into that link, you're going to notice uh, that we have a full schedule for the webinars that are coming up. Uh, we also have an opportunity on that page for you to view any of the past webinars that we've recorded, uh, which we will be recording all of the webinars. And I'm also publishing white papers for each webinar uh, so that you have a printed text that goes with the message behind the content that's in the webinar. I would encourage you to use that printed text to use the webinars in your organizations uh, to kind of extend the information and the training throughout your organization. Uh, and then give us any feedback that you have on the information, the format, uh, the, the, the printed text material, and let us know if there's anything else that we can do to help you drive best practice in the restoration market in UK. That's what we're here for. That's what we want to support because we're partners in this industry uh, and it's to all of our best interests that we move forward with the best foot possible and ensure the success of the industry at large for you and for us and the rest of the restoration community. So we're here to support you. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much for joining us. And we'll have the date of our next webinar uh, up on the website. And in fact, you'll notice it on screen. It's set right now for September 4th, 2013 at 12 o'clock p.m. The discussion is going to be optimizing drying conditions. So moving into the intermediate side of humidity, airflow, and temperature. So again, thank you for joining us. Uh, Brandon Burton with Restoration Sciences Academy, and we'll talk to you next time.